Hello to those of you who have joined us already. We are going to get started very quickly, but we are just going to take a few short moments to wait and let others join us before we get started with today's event. Thank you for joining. All right, we will go ahead and get started. And um, of course, others can keep on joining us as we get going. So I want to say welcome to, today, to everyone for joining us today um, for our webinar titled Technology for Good, Scalable Interventions to Support Student Loneliness and Its Correlates. My name is Emma Welton, and I'll be your moderator for today. I am the Assistant Director for the Illinois Higher Education Center for Alcohol, Other Drug, and Violence Prevention. That's kind of a mouthful, so we do just call it IHEC for short, and I'm very excited to be hosting today's event. Before I hand over the microphone for today's webinar, I have a few little housekeeping things to go over about GoToWebinar and the platform that we are using. So if you're new to using GoToWebinar and you've not really had much experience with it before, you will see the control panel on the right of your screen. This will be handy for you. This is where you can find the question box, on the right side. So if you open that question box, you can type in any questions that you may have for the presenter and we will get to those when we can. So everyone will be muted. All of the attendees will be muted throughout today's presentation, but we do highly encourage you to use that question box and utilize it if you do have any questions or comments that you would like to share. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Nathan Demers. He is a clinical psychologist with experience working in a variety of clinical settings, including college counseling, and he is currently the vice president and director of clinical programs with you at college, working at the intersection of behavioral health and technology. So now I would like to hand over the microphone. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Emma. Uh, just to confirm, I know everyone can't respond, but Emma, you're still hearing me okay and the screen seems to be working fine? Yep, it looks all good for my end. Great, perfect. Well, thank you all for being here during what I know is uh, can be an extremely busy time of year. Um, I'm very passionate about this topic and um, we'll cover a lot of ground today and I'll make sure that we have time at the end for questions. And as Emma mentioned, please feel free to use that question box and as we're able, we will answer those as we're going and or make sure we save time at the end. So I know Emma gave a quick introduction to me. I want to just give a little bit further context to how I ended up in this role as a clinical psychologist. Um, at a very high level, I worked in a traditional clinical settings, quote unquote, for a number of years, including college counseling, um, community behavioral health, inpatient neuro and burn ICUs, and fell in love with college counseling. And one thing I got a little bit frustrated with was the fact that volume has just been increasing year over year. However, we know our budgets have not been increasing in accordance with those increase in those being served. So with that, I started looking at other positions and I worked for a nonprofit for a number of years whose mission was to bring quality behavioral health services to rural and underserved areas in the Western 15 states and American territories in the Pacific. And quite frankly, and pretty quickly, I just fell in love with working on this larger scale um, instead of a student being my client across the room from me, all of a sudden Alaska was my client or American Samoa. 
And I pretty quickly realized that there aren't a lot of clinicians working in these larger systems of care. So with that, I fell in love and um, about three and a half years ago, three years ago-ish, um, like everything in life, I met the, the right crew of people who really had a similar goal and were looking to go at this issue of upstream behavioral health um, in a different way. So with that, I was able to join this team at that time, and um, now we're here. So that's a little bit about me, but more importantly, let's let's jump into loneliness and, and um, colleges. So with that, and I want to start at 50 or maybe even 100,000 foot view here to get us off the ground. One thing we know is that there is this myth that college is going to be amazing and that students, and I'd argue younger and younger um, in grade, middle school, junior high, high school, are saying, you know what, college is going to be it. That's the pinnacle of my career. And with that, we also know that our media, for better or worse, and I would argue worse, is also portraying this incredible experience that everyone has in college. And I admittedly haven't seen this, um, this threequill, if you will, but my understanding and the pieces I have seen is that it's about a student who falls in love with acapella and finds that on, you know, the first club day. And it wasn't, it was so good that there's a second, a second in a tree quill, whatever that word would be. I know that's not the right word, but um, it just goes to show that in our media, there is this notion that college is going to be the best four years of your life. And you know what, if not, something's wrong with you. And unfortunately, when we look at the data, this is really becoming true for more and more students. This is from ACHA, the American College Health Association, their assessment in 2017. And we can see that 30% of students are fe reporting feeling very lonely in the past two weeks, and over 60% are reporting feeling very lonely in the past year. And the, the thing I'd like to really call attention to is this isn't just reporting, hey, I'm a little bit lonely, I didn't know what to do this Friday night. This is experiencing a much more profound sense of loneliness and a lack of connection. So this is very significant. So getting to the project and how we came to be, it's an interesting story like uh, many, many good projects and startups. So this partnership to address this issue of loneliness is a partnership between two organizations. And our joint goal is to reduce loneliness in young people to prevent adverse health effects, both now and in the future. So I'm going to talk about a little, excuse me, I'm going to talk a little bit about our partner organization first. So Hope Lab is a social innovation lab based in San Francisco. And they are a, they're funded by the Omidyar Network, which is the family that started eBay. And they're an amazing organization and they have the opportunity to really research, study and implement solutions in a way that a lot of other people can't, being a foundation. So their mission is really around helping the well-being of adolescents and young adults. And the first way that they actually did that was helping support adolescent cancer survivors by s helping them stay adherent to their treatments. So their first platform was actually a, a video game that helped students, or st not students, excuse me, adolescent cancer survivors understand and, s and be adherent to their treatment regimens. And everything Hope Lab does, they research rigorously. So they did a randomized control trial and they were actually able to prove that students, young people, excuse me, who played this video game actually extended their lifespan. So with that, they've done several other projects and about a year and a half ago, they did a systems mapping exercise to say, what is the next big, big issue that we can tackle and have the biggest impact? And long story short, we could do a whole webinar on that systems mapping exercise, but they landed on loneliness. And in keeping up with some of the literature, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Surgeon General coming out saying the experience of loneliness is the equivalent of smacking about a pack, smoking, not smacking, smoking a pack of cigarettes per day. Um, we also see worldwide the UK appointed a minister of loneliness. So we're catching on. So with that, they were looking for partners to help work in this space and develop this platform. And long story short, they found us with you at college. So I'm gonna give you a little bit about our background, and I know I'm doing multiple layers of background, but I think understanding the foundations of our organizations are really integral in understanding our work and where we're going. 
So our first venture was actually helping address suicide prevention amongst ma male working class populations. So before diving into this, I'm going to try playing a video. It's only 30 seconds, so if it doesn't work great, um, not the end of the world. We only lost 30 seconds, but hopefully this audio and video will come through. Going to give it a shot on this next slide. Here we go. So I'm not sure if that audio came through. I'm sorry if it didn't, but this is mantherapy.org. So in 2012, the Office of Suicide Prevention in Colorado wanted to address the very high and alarming rates of suicide amongst working class men. And when we dove into that data, what we quickly found is the majority of men dying by suicide are doing so by means of a handgun. And if we wait until a man is in a suicidal crisis and has a loaded gun, the likelihood of any sort of intervention is slim to none. So our challenge became, how do we go upstream and get this demographic of men who generally doesn't like talking about mental health, talking about mental health? So we created a, a fictitious doctor in a confidential and anonymous website. And we really marketed and branded this fictitious therapist as part football coach, part drinking buddy, and part therapist. And he talks to men like men. He's vulgar at times. I highly recommend you check out mantherapy.org. It's a free website. And when we launched, of course, as a digital platform, it went well beyond our borders in Colorado. So the Atlantic picked up a story, 20 states ended up adopting it, Australia made their own version of the platform, and most recently we actually did a partnership with Facebook where we, we were able to target men at risk for depression, violent behavior, and suicidal ideation with man therapy, quote unquote ads, of course we're not selling anything except psychoeducation, but with that it was one of the most successful campaigns that Facebook has actually ever run in terms of engagement. And we're able to get tens of thousands to men of men to take our quote unquote head inspection, which is essentially a mental health screening tool. In this instance, we really just made it fun and more likable for men. So with the success, success of mantherapy.org, we were actually contacted by Colorado State University. I didn't mention that we're located in Denver, so they're just up the road from us. And they actually had two academic years where they tragically had well above the num average number of suicides that they experience on campus. So with that, they said, you know, we have a full counseling center of about 50 clinicians. We clearly need to do something different. So with that, they said, you know, you did this mantherapy.org thing. I wonder if we can put our heads together and make something for passionate about this topic and we would love to. So what we did was we took man therapy and put it in front of college students and they said we like Quite frankly, this is for my white dad. This is not matching my experience. And we know that, of course, there's a wealth of diversity that exists upon college campuses. <clears throat> So our initial working hypothesis was, let's make a mental health fitness center for students. And the first thing they said right off the bat when we did our focus groups was, you know what, that doesn't sound like Even though I'm stressed out of my mind, I'm away from home for the first time, I'm homesick, I'm coping with drugs and alcohol, so I'm not sleeping well, I'm missing my classes. That's, that's someone else. Someone else should go to the counseling center. So with that, what we quickly learned is that we had to really make this platform more about well-being. And putting on that clinical hat, I know that loneliness sometimes is the root cause of a student being in crisis. Or oftentimes it's a breakup, the loss of a grandparent, a parent, or something as quote-unquote simple and address all these aspects of well-being. Two, students said, I don't want another crisis line. I want something that's upstream that can help me ideally build the skills long before there's a challenge that comes my way. And then when it comes to digital platforms, not surprisingly, if we're going to ask students to use any sort of digital piece or platform or app, 
If we don't look as quote unquote cool as Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, take your pick, students aren't going to use it. And I think testament to that, even in our own lives, is we know NIMH, the CDC, American Psychological Association, they have great evidence-based resources out there. But A, I don't even go there that often, and we know our students are not turning to those websites. And then these last two were really important. Students said, if this isn't confidential and anonymous, I'm not going to use it. Because if I go to this site and I type in loneliness, prescription drug abuse, or sexual assault, and I'm worried that Nathan or someone else from my university is going to knock on my door, I'm either A, not going to use your site, or B, I'll use it, but I'm not going to endorse what's really going on, which of course would totally defeat the purpose. <clears throat> but then on the other hand, we know that everything in a student's world in today's world is personalized. We know the experience at Western Wyoming Community College is different than Colorado State, is different than Stanford, is different than Middlebury College. And furthermore, we also know that the, ex the experience of a student athlete might be or is very different than a student veteran, a non-traditional student, or an international student. So we also had to speak to those identities. So after we synthesized all of our academic research in addition to all that we learned in those focus groups, we came up with a three-tiered approach to well-being. Succeed is all about academic and career success. And after all, we know this is where a lot of student stress initially starts. And if left unchecked, can obviously develop into much more significant symptomology. And even simple scenarios like being overly stressed about school so you're not putting time into your relationships can lead someone to experiencing loneliness and further down the road, a depressive episode. Thrive, again, this is where we hide the vegetables, if you will. So this is the backbone of the site. This is where we have all the information about mental and physical well-being. And narcissistically, as a clinician on the team, I'm very proud in that this is by far the most viewed content on the site. Specifically, it's stress, anxiety, depression, how to help a friend I'm worried about, and sleep coming in at number five. So even though most students come in for succeed, they're stumbling and finding their way to content that's very important to them. And then matters all about purpose, meaning, relationships, involvement. This is very much where loneliness fits as well. And we know that 90% of students' time on campus throughout their college experience is spent outside of the classroom. So making sure that we're addressing that aspect of a student's experience in accordance with their development is, of course, extremely important. So with that, we took those lessons and made a uh, digital platform to address all those things. And with that, we've been very successful. We've grown to have a partnership network of 30 campuses. And what's very exciting is whenever a new campus comes on board, they have new ideas for content and functionality and pieces like that, which as soon as we develop that for one campus, we're able to share that with the rest of our other campuses. So we're able to create an economy of scale and a a culture where every piece of the puzzle, if you will, makes the whole much greater. And when it comes in, to engagement, one thing we're very proud of is that because we adopted this well being approach, platform. So at Colorado State University, an institution of about 33,000 students, we've had over 50,000 unique users. We've had over 20,000 reality checks, which again, in our words, are mental health screeners. With a great average time on site, we've connected over 45,000 students to specific resources, whether that's online evidence-based resources or campus-specific supports. And again, this is only at Colorado State University. But these other pieces that have been really exciting and encouraging in what we're doing is that we know 87% of students are learning about a new resource, whether that's a new club, an intramural sport, or the career center. We know students who are connected on campus are less likely to experience loneliness and tend to be happier, healthier, and more likely to graduate. We have the majority learning uh, uh, being able to better manage their stress. And this last one is one that I'm almost most proud of in that we know almost or 98% of our first year users report learning new skills and resources across each of those three domains. And knowing that 
that time in life can be very malleable and students are getting a lot of independences, maybe being on their own for the first time, making decisions about substances, sexual health, their work ethic when it comes to the classroom. So all these pieces, knowing that we're connecting students to evidence-based resources at that time, can plant positive health-related behaviors, not just through the college experience, but throughout the lifespan. And then the other piece that's very important to us is when it comes to well-being, we see that students are coming to this platform for a number of different reasons, whether it's feeling more connected to campus, learning specifically about physical or mental health, study habits, learning about identity, identities different from their own, So this is where the stories converge again with us and Hope Lab. So we built a very successful, confidential and anonymous platform that's showing great results. But with that, we really wanted to do more when it comes to the issue of loneliness. And as you can imagine, when you make a platform that's both confidential and anonymous, it can be pretty challenging to encourage social connections via that app because, again, it's totally confidential and anonymous. So we were really lucky that Hope Lab did their systems mapping exercise and found us and vice versa at the right time when we were really both trying to tackle this issue of loneliness. So one thing both of our teams very strongly believe in is that in order to solve any sort of problem, never mind something as complex as human behavior, you have to deeply, deeply understand it. So with that, one thing that's very important to us is A, getting in front of students, but before we even start this process, engaging students in what research questions should we be asking? Because of course, if we start a research process and we're not asking the right question or don't have the right hypothesis, that can obviously lead us astray away from what we're actually trying to solve. So starting with the academic research, one thing we know about loneliness is that it's currently associated with anxiety, stress, poor sleep, and substance use. And it also leads to future increases in depression, suicidal ideation, and self-harm. And then going back to what I alluded to in my introduction, we also know that, excuse me, um, we also know that nationally, more and more students are presenting for behavioral health supports. And this traditional model of saying, you know what, all the behavioral health needs, they get taken care of in the counseling center. And more often than not, in my experience, it's changing. That counseling center tends to be in the basement on the farthest building from campus that no one wants to go to. And at best case scenario, we know counseling centers see about 10 to 15% on the very high end of students. When we add these up, we can see that about 74% of students are saying that my academic performance inhibited my, sorry, my mental health negatively impacted my academic performance. And then I know I alluded to this and I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, but we know college counseling center utilization rates are going up at a rate five times that of enrollment. And again, I know that our budgets aren't going up five times. And speaking from my clinical experience and looking at literature, we also know that loneliness is a big faster factor that's also driving up some of this utilization. But not a very student success and persistence, we know that a lot of students are indeed not continuing on in their educational careers because of this issue. So this is an exit survey that is deployed at the University of Washington, who does a really, they put a lot of time and resources into trying to get every student who does not persist to fill out this survey. And we're of course sharing this with this with their permission. But what we can see is the number one reason for leaving UW is that I was emotionally depressed or distressed. Two is I was not doing well academically. Three, the classes were too big. But four, I felt socially, socially alone. So what we see here is that two of the top four reasons actually have to do with behavioral health and feeling socially alone is coming in at 41%, which is just two percentages below academic reasons. So why I think this is so important, I think we all who are in the health professions have been sort of beating this drum for years saying we need, need more resources and student well-being and loneliness is absolutely negatively impacting the, the college experience. But what this is really telling us is that this isn't just our challenge in health and counseling and health promotions. This is absolutely a campus-wide issue that we need to get 
cross-departmental support because we all have a horse in this race, so to speak. So with that, this begs the question, of course, what do we do about this? So the route our team took is going back to that in-depth research process, we, our first step is addressing this issue of loneliness and understanding it intimately from both a design perspective and a research perspective. So from a design perspective, what we want to know is what is college like today? What might be different today versus five years ago, versus 10, versus 50 years ago that might be leading to some of these challenges? And of course, what does loneliness in college feel like in a very tangible way? What's getting in the way of friendships? What are students trying or not trying? Are they taking swings or missing? And then of course, from a research perspective, one thing we really have to be very tied into is knowing what and how psychologically and when it comes to behavior, do students who are lonely, excuse me, how do students who are experiencing loneliness behave or think differently than a student who is not? And of course, turning to the scientific literature to say, how can we learn and help students build these aspects of their experience? So with that, we went out and started identifying students who are indeed experiencing loneliness to make sure that we're, of course, researching our target population. So if individuals are familiar with UCLA's loneliness scale, scale, excuse me, these are a few example items from it. This is what we used to screen our participants to make sure that we're getting our target demographic. And from there, we went out to four universities to try and do our best to get a cross section of this experience. And one thing that we've come across over and over that's been very reassuring, and this actually stems a lot from Howard Gardner's work at Harvard, who's been doing a long longitudinal study, multi-million dollar study on the college experience. But one of his findings is that a lot of the challenges that whether you're at an Ivy League school, a large state school, a small private liberal arts or community college, a lot of the issues that are being experienced are culturally very similar, if not exactly the same. And I saw him speak a little bit a little while ago. He said two of the biggest challenges or the two biggest challenges that campuses are facing right now. One is mental health or behavioral health. And two is the issue of belongingness, which I would argue is extremely tied, if not almost overlapping completely on a Venn diagram to that of loneliness. So with that, once we got into this data and undertook our focus groups, these are a few themes that we heard from students over and over again. So the first thing that we heard is a lot of times students feel like magically somehow they're going to wake up when they get to college after their last day of summer vacation as a high school student and socially they're just going to have all these skills And I feel like this quote really sums this experience up from Ian, a senior, who said, you think that everyone will be more mature, but the thing is, you're only a few months older than you were in high school, which of course is the reality of the situation. And the other piece or anecdote that I think is really tied to this, one thing we know is that a lot more students are achieving higher education, which is awesome, undoubtedly. But on the other side, we also know that that can present a number of challenges for students who, let's say, are from a small town in rural Colorado and find themselves at a Colorado State University or CU Boulder, an institution of 30,000 students. So that student in their small town has maybe had their same friend group from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade simply because it's a small community. So with that, one thing that that student may or may not have gained is learned the art or the skills of friending because it simply wasn't an experience that they grew up with. So throwing them into a giant sea of people can be A, extremely overwhelming, but B, not, of, or not be setting them up for success. So the other thing, and this really comes with a lot of um, unspoken pressure, if you will, that a lot of students are reporting feeling like, I, this is where I'm gonna meet my friends for life, and there's a pressure to do so. And this quote again sums it up really well from my perspective. And excuse me for one second, I have to clear my throat. <coughs> 
I heard it from my dad. He had an amazing college experience. They're still having reunions 40 years later. You think college is where you'll meet your best friends. So again, going back to that pressure piece, students are feeling like this is what I have to do. And there's a, a pressure to perform not only in the classroom, but in this social realm. And then this one I found very, very interesting. A lot of students really reporting, reported, excuse me, that they expect to find friendships and for it to happen naturally or just effortlessly. Like it's um, almost a, a magical sense of, you know, I met, I walked down like a pitch perfect and saw that club and they were my people. And we just instantly formed this bond. And this quote really sums that up of a student saying, friendships just happen naturally. It'd be weird to force it. And when we peel the onion back a little bit, what I find really interesting is that students feel and feel like it is okay and acceptable, like they actually know that when it comes to my familial relationships and I'm away at college, yeah, I have to put in time and effort to make sure I'm still in touch in the way that I wanna be. And of course, when it comes to romantic relationships, courting and finding a potential partner takes a lot of time, effort, energy. I'm going to swing and miss sometimes. That's okay. But when it comes to friendships, that's just supposed to happen. That's a different category. Yet, of course, we all know these are interpersonal relationships, just like any of those other categories that I just mentioned. So that's another really interesting finding that we had. So with all that, and for students who are experiencing loneliness, what we've really heard is that they feel like making friends becomes an impossible challenge, especially if during orientation, it feels like friend groups are forming right away based on your hall or specific clubs or athletics. And a lot of times students feel like I missed the boat and there's nothing I can do about it. So this of course brings us to what is the definition of loneliness? This is a very important piece for us to operationally define before we start to challenge this. So what we found is that the experience of loneliness is the gap in the, in your, in the relationships that you would like and those that you currently have. I'm gonna say that one more time because I quite admittedly stuttered through the first one. It's the gap in the relationships that you have and those that you want. So one thing that's very important there is this has nothing to do with social isolation. I feel like culturally, a lot of times when we imagine a student or individual experiencing loneliness, we think of someone who might be a little bit more introverted, excluded, works in their room a lot, but that's not the case at all. So if I have a significant gap in the relationships and that I have and those that I want, I can be the star quarterback of the football team, be beloved by all of campus, be in a fraternity, supposedly have 40 brothers that I can turn to for anything. But if those relationships are maybe more surfacey than I had wanted or expected, or I don't feel like I can turn to these people for support, I can be experiencing loneliness. And a great book that shed some light on this, this fact or phenomena is what made Maddie run, for those of you that might be familiar. It's a, a really tragic story of a very successful young woman who I believe was at Penn, and she apparently or it appeared that she had it all on the surface. She was a NCAA competitive athlete at the top of her game, 4.0 student, well-liked, attractive, and she really tragically died by suicide. And the book does a really good job working backwards. And it turned out that loneliness, that gap in those relationships, was a contributing factor to that decision to end her life. So that's a very important piece. And I really encourage you all to let that sink in because we need to make sure in whatever programming we're developing on campus, we're thinking of loneliness using this definition. So one thing I'm very proud and I really love about my job, as opposed to just being in the, the research perspective, and no offense to folks who exclusively do research, but one thing that's very exciting about what we get to do here is we get to research a problem. And again, we devoted a team of nine people to do this research over the course of about eight or nine months. And after synthesizing that, in addition to sharing our results, we actually get to make something and do something about that problem and ideally solve it and help tens of thousands, if not more of students. 
So with that, I'm going to turn the corner and talk about some of our inset, insights that are very actionable that we're actually using in building our intervention, but also can be used by anyone to develop any sort of programming or policies on your campus to help address the issue of loneliness. And I included this little spoiler alert down, down bottom. We were working with the campus, um, a dean of students, and before we even shared any of this research or talked about it, she said, if someone tells me that the solution to loneliness is doing another movie night, I am quite frankly just going to pull my hair out. And what she was really tapping into, more than just the fact that, of course, movie nights aren't the most social activities, is that for a student who's experiencing loneliness, the solution is not just throwing them into a group of another students, of more students. Because, of course, a student experiencing loneliness might not have those tools to be able to form those relationships in that group. We can actually and unintentionally be further stigmatizing and actually increase the cycle of loneliness, which we'll talk about in just a minute. So with that and something else that's very important is before we develop anything to intervene, we had to develop a working model of loneliness to make sure that we know where we can intervene in this cycle. So with that, this is the cycle of loneliness that surfaced as a result of our impact pathway work, which I know I'm not going into the weeds of, but it's essentially getting all the ingredients that contribute to a student experiencing loneliness. So once a student is there, this is the cycle that leads to that experience and what really makes it vicious because it feeds back into itself. So to walk through this diagram, what we heard, and as I alluded to with those quotes, is a lot of times students are coming in with this great pressure to find their friendships, but not put work into it, but I have to put work into it. So they feel like the social environment is somewhat threatening. So with that, they're entering college at times with somewhat of a guarded approach on that first day. And from there, for an individual who's taking a guarded approach in relationships or is experiencing loneliness or depression, one thing we know is in interpersonal relationships, they tend to be focused very inward. So for example, if I was experiencing loneliness or depression, I know I'm not seeing you all face to face and interacting, but during this webinar, what I would be more worried about psychologically now is, oh, I just stu stuttered over that word, or what are they thinking? Maybe they don't like this slide. Something doesn't look right. And of course, if I'm tending to myself in that level of detail, it makes it very hard for me to be present and attuned to that other person across from me. So with that, what others who are talking to students feeling experiencing loneliness say is, oh yeah, I met Nathan and he's a nice guy, but I just really didn't get to know him. And a lot of times when someone doesn't feel that connection, it's unlikely that they're gonna be reaching out and actually looking to further that relationship. So from there, students who are experiencing loneliness start to criticize their stuck state. Again, going back to having that locus of control and all eyes and ears and attention on themselves, they start to say, that person didn't want to help, like, hang out with me because they don't like me, because they think I'm weird, because I'm not smart enough or not in the right major. So with that, instead of saying, you know, let's say I do take a swing, a social risk, and I say, hey, you want to get coffee after class, and someone says, no, I can't, and walks off, I, if I'm experiencing loneliness, might will likely attribute that to myself, saying that person doesn't like me. Instead of being able to take an approach that says, maybe that person just has somewhere else to be, has a class, an exam, or something. So again, it becomes a very critical state that individuals get stuck in. And then from there, what's being constantly reinforced, as in the example I just provided, is there's nothing I can do about it. So with that, what we heard from a number of students is that they think the solution to their loneliness on campus is actually transferring. They say that, you know what, this isn't the place for me. These aren't my people. I'm going to pick up and try somewhere else. And we interviewed very, several students who actually had that experience. And when they picked up and moved, what they brought with them was actually a new attitude and approach to friendships when they switched gears. Many moved back home and attended a community college or something like that, which 
obviously brought with them some other natural supports. So for us, what we want to be able to do is be able to help facilitate that process, of course, without a student having to go through all the work of dropping out, switching schools, encouraging debt, feeling like a failure, et cetera, et cetera. So with that, what we really want to do is help students adopt more of a positive mindset or a growth mindset, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. So the first thing what we want to do is help encourage students to try an open approach in their relationships. And I presented at the Council of Independent Colleges President's Institute and had a really fascinating conversation around this. And we talked about, you know, what are our colleges putting forth in terms of our materials and accepted students days and all of our websites? And it's that college is going to be the best four years of your life. It's going to be incredible. And the reality is that is the experience for many people, but even folks who have an amazing experience, I can say myself included, there was a number of roadblocks and hurdles and really tough times. So it's interesting to say, can the conversation actually start to change there by saying, you know what, college is or can be an amazing experience, but that's not to say it's not going to have its hurdles along the way. And with that, can we help encourage students to say, you know what, maybe it's okay to take some swings and, and miss once in a while and try an open approach and throw yourself out there rather than starting by saying, oh, I should be a little bit guarded and reserved. And then the second piece is actually one of the most important pieces of this cycle. So helping students reflect with compassion when they do take a swing and miss on that experience is one of the most influential pieces of this process. What we found is that if we encourage students to take social risks, it's actually more important how they reflect upon that rather than how the actual intervention went. So let's just say I'm throwing out um, what the intervention I tried was try smiling at 10 people today, hold the door for someone or spark up a conversation with a, a stranger, which of course is a, a very high risk. Regardless of the outcome, how I process and reflect that is more important than that outcome. So the last thing or the last piece of this and intervention point is how can we help students develop that mindset that yes, I can do something about that. I'm experiencing loneliness, but this is not a fixed skill set that I do or do not have. It's something that I can work on, further develop and cultivate moving forward. So with that, what I'd like to share is our five insights to action, which can really help campuses, administrators, clinicians, even working outside of the, the college space, harness to help address this issue of loneliness. So of course, we're using these insights to build a prototype of an app, or the prototype's a step along the way of what we're building. Um, but these are the insights we're using that can be used elsewhere. And we'll talk a little bit more about what we're making, but before clouding the vision, I wanna share these with you to ideally be able to take and use as you will. And I would encourage you as we walk through these to maybe jot down notes or just think about ways that you could use these principles in any current planning, policy development, changes to your orientation that you might be able to do. And when I present in person, I love having conversations about this and breaking into small groups. But of course, webinars have some amazing abilities to get people in the room, but also have some drawbacks. So the first one is we really need to work as administrators to help students understand that this myth of magical friendship is false. You don't just show up to campus and fall into these amazing friendship groups where you're friends for the next 40 years like that student alluded to. And as you can imagine, I'm sure there's an, sorry, as I hope you are already imagining, there's a number of ways that we can start to do this from including slight programming and orientation that conveys this message all the way over to mentorships programs or blogs where students who are older in their career can say, you know what, my first, my first year and part of my sophomore year were actually really rough and I didn't really find my friend group until I tried X, Y, or Z. So that's just a couple examples of ways that we can start to get at this on campuses. Excuse me, I'm just gonna have a sip of water. 
The second one is we have to help give students or empower students with tools to take these so-called social risks. So there's a number of different ways to do it. And I think many of us do this in some ways, whether it be icebreakers on dorm floors or things like that. But what's very important is during orientation, students are drinking water from a fire hose, without a doubt. And for some students, of course, they're energized by that, being excited about a new place, new people, just seeing what their world's gonna be like. But quite frankly, if I'm an introvert, orientation can be unbelievably draining. So that's a student we need to think about. But where I was really going with that is, we do this really well during orientation and maybe those first few weeks of school, but a lot of the programming around connecting tends to, to drop down a little bit, admittedly, after those couple weeks of school. So with that, we need to make sure that we can continue forming these opportunities, not just a movie night, something that actually encourages meaningful connection among students. And one thing in our instance that we found that um, is very much working to our advantage is if we or when we make this app and we encourage a student to take a social risk, as I mentioned, trying to smile at 10 people or all the way on the other end of the spectrum, sit down with a stranger at the dining hall. That's interestingly like the universally most intimidating thing a college student can experience. But with that, if they try that social risk and it doesn't work or doesn't go as they planned, one thing that's great is they can blame this app and they can say that was a dumb challenge. And what that's doing is interrupting that cycle and helping them not just turn inward and say, the problem is me. The problem can actually be external. So that's very important when we're creating these tools to try. If we can help students identify and have that locus of control, not just be internal, that can go a very long way for students. And as I mentioned, I'm sure you're not surprised that this is on that list. Um, we have to help find ways for students to process setbacks with compassion. And I would say even before processing with compassion, we also need to help students process those experiences. In today's day, day and age, we know that a lot of times students engage in what I like to call social snacking, which is if I just want to hop on social media and like a few things and send a quick message, I can do that very quickly and that can satisfy at least temporarily that need for connection. But as we know, that tends to be, and I know I'm generalizing, it tends to be somewhat surfacy. So we need to create spaces for students, whether that's digitally with a journal, whether that's um, an interpersonal process group all the way on the, the other end of the spectrum, that creates the space for students to reflect on their social experiences. And again, ideally doing so in a productive way that's helping them reflect with compassion. So this is another very important one, which feels so simple, but is very easily forgotten. And this is very much tied to that one student saying that, you know, I expect that I change overnight when I get to college. So we know for a student who has grown up with the same friend group from kindergarten through 12th grade, that learning this skill set is going to take some time and energy. Even if I do have this skill set in my back pocket when I'm getting to college, college is a very different place than where I've used this elsewhere. So I'm going to need to do some fine tuning to adjust these skills to make them work in this new environment. So we really need to convey to students that this is a marathon and not a sprint and you can't just go to the gym once and then all of a sudden be able to bench press 450 pounds. Similarly, you can't just say this week I'm going to do this one thing and then magically I'm going to be where I want to be. So I'm sure you can imagine again, anecdotally, there's a number of different ways that we can get at this from digital interventions to sharing stories to speakers in workshops and other programs on campus. And then one thing that is admittedly unique about higher education is that we can control the environment in many ways that we can't in the, the outside world, if you will. Um, that's a terrible term, but I think you all know what I'm saying. Um, so what we can do is make sure that our um, residence halls, that our first year experience classes, that orientation activities, that at the start of sophomore year or the beginning of 
the second semester that first year, that we're putting thought and time towards these groups of students or how we can group these students and utilize these principles to be able to help develop and interrupt with this cycle of loneliness. So the way I like to think about these is I like to use those first four steps and then really embed them in the college environment because we have such a unique ability in higher education to really tap into students are eating here, they're living here, they're working out here, they're going to class here. Where are all the different ways that we can intervene to really help support this challenge of loneliness? So as I alluded to, what we're doing is we're using these insights to develop a digital tool that can help students build a mindset and skills to build satisfying social connections. And I know when I get a lot of pushback from people that say it's pretty ironic that you're using a digital intervention to help people connect. For me, and this is a real lesson that we learned from you at college, is that we need to meet students on their terms. And whether we like it or not, students are spending a lot of time on their devices, whether that's a laptop, smartphone, or tablet. So if we're not meeting them there, we might never meet them, which of course is a much bigger loss. So with that, what we're doing is meeting them on their terms and taking a scaffolded approach to help them take social risks, as we're calling them, that's not what we call them in the app because it's pretty academic and lame, um, to take those risks to expand their relationships in the quote unquote real world. So what this is shaping up to be, this is very much a, a working prototype. We have multiple drafts of these, but what the experience is shaping up to look like is a student coming in, taking a very quick assessment saying, I am experiencing a lot of loneliness, I'm not experiencing loneliness. And then there's a number of guides and exercises that students can engage in. And similarly to you at college, one thing we're doing that's very important is incorporating principles of motivational interviewing and stages of change into this work. For some students, some students, excuse me, they might be ready to jump in and go sit down with that stranger in the dining hall. But we know for the majority of students, they're probably not quite there. And maybe trying to smile at 10 people is even too much. So helping them do some internal work, such as looking at their inner critic, understanding that voice in their head that might be getting in the way and contributing to this cycle. And then again, engage in these acts and be able to journal about it, either record with their voice, do an open text field. And what's fun and exciting about apps like this is we can actually give students or reminders or nudges to engage in this. Because we know we all have great wishes after New Year's to do X, Y, and Z and then drop off. So knowing that students are spending so much time with these digital devices, we're actually able to provide those behavioral nudges and keep them on track to keep this on maybe not the top of their priority list, but at least on their priority list. So with that, that's the bulk of what I was really hoping to present on today. And we have about seven minutes left. I would love to open it up for questions. Quite frankly, I'm not sure if any have come in as of yet, but I will check that right now. And Emma, if you're happy to help field those, I would appreciate it. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge. I really appreciate it. Um, at this time, we haven't had any submitted yet. So um, for any of our attendees, if you have anything you'd like to ask, you could go ahead and open that question box and write in anything and we'll get to that. Great, thank you, Emma. And um, I did just throw my contact information up here. Should anyone have any questions, I'm more than happy to be in touch to reach out one-on-one -on -one, um, about Hope Lab, you at college, this project or anything between. Um, one thing I also didn't mention is we are also looking for pilot campuses to test this app out. We will be testing it out with several of our U at College campuses this fall, but there's obviously great opportunity for campuses who don't fall within our campus partner network to give this a shot. I actually have a question. Um, sure. I really like how you had the place in the app for giving any kind of feedback, so like the voice memo type or writing anything. Who gets to see that? Is it just the student or would anybody else see what they put in that section? 
Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So thus far, we're designing it to be only for that student. And the reason for that, we're doing some thinking around it, but of course, um, as soon as we let people anonymously report things or anything like that, if we notice anything concerning, that can be a significant liability and can cause a lot of harm. I think of the, the story of Yik Yak, where um, a lot of individuals did a lot of harm by, quite frankly, doing hateful things anonymously yes. so we're trying to crack that um, some potential ways are having some people if we see themes that individuals are noting being able to post that as this is what a lot of people are experiencing or posting some of the top ones and letting people do the classic thumbs up thumbs down things like that so that's a design challenge that we'll be working on in the next uh, two to three weeks actually Perfect, thanks. And then we do have a question that came in and I can read that for you now. Sure, it I is, actually, oh, you got it, go ahead. Um, do you have any suggestions on programs that build connectedness? We have noticed we do a lot of programs but not necessarily ones that specifically promote connections. Yeah, it's a really great question and um, it's a funny question that you ask. Um, the reason that we're, we're making this app, quite frankly, is that we didn't find anything out there that really does this in a scalable way. Um, I'm sure you're very familiar with a lot of the mentorship programs that are out there. There's some amazing programs for first generation students and other demographics that might be at risk for premature dropout. Um, but with that, those are very high touch, very costly programs to implement. And one thing that we're very passionate about is being able to do this scalably and cost effectively so that we can reach the most amount of individuals possible. So with that, I'm sorry I don't have a great recommendation for um, a program that can help build those connections on campus, but I would encourage you to take these five insights and try and be able to brainstorm what are the ways that we can pretty easily make some slight shifts into existing programming on campus to interrupt this cycle. Awesome. Thank you for your feedback. Well, thanks for the question, Kate. Sorry I don't have a better answer for you. Happy to connect to another conversation if you wanted to dig a little deeper. And with that, we can just wait a few more minutes if anyone's got any questions, but I do want to take this time to thank um, our presenter. Thank you very much for presenting for us. I really appreciate it. And thank you to also all of the attendees who joined us today. And um, yeah, and if anybody has any questions as well, maybe after the program, you can reach out. Um, Nathan gave us his contact information, which is great, but also if you don't have that, or you can contact me and I can get in touch with him as well, and we can get you sorted if you have anything. So, oh, we actually do have something else that came through. Great, well, thank you everyone. I'll stick around for the next couple minutes, but anyone else, uh, feel free to go about your day. I really appreciate your time and attention. Thank you. We do have another question. And yes, it is. You got it. The beauty right. of conference calls. <laughs> um, do you have resources um, regarding encouraging growth mindset? Got it. It's a great question. So we have a, I've found a lot of resources regarding a growth mindset. And rather than being a resource or a program, what we found are a lot of times is there are simple CBT exercises or snippets. So we've encoded, excuse me, incorporated a number of those into our platform, you at college as individual resources. And if that's something you'd like to shoot a quick note about, I'd be happy to share some of those resources. But again, it's not necessarily a, a programmatic thing that you would introduce to all your students in orientation. They're more one-off little exercises. Of course, another great place to work on a growth mindset is in academic advising, in therapy. Again, these are much higher touch interventions, um, but I am happy to reach out with some of those that we've found. So thank you for the question, Dorothy. And thank you everyone for the thank yous that you are providing. <laughs> I really appreciate it. And again, I'm happy Yeah, thank you very much um, for everything. And it was a really great webinar. If any one of the attendees do have anything, feel free to 
reach out. And with that, I think we will call it an afternoon. Thank you guys so much. Thanks everyone. And thank you, Emma and IHEC for all the work in setting this up. Of course, everyone have a good rest of your day. Bye. Bye.